this is a part two of the uh, sessions, uh, AWS Solution Architect uh, Essentials. Uh, my name is uh, Fasil Khwaja and uh, I am VP Engineering here at uh, Quick Start. Um, in my last session, I have given my brief intro. I'm a solution architect uh, certified on AWS and uh, 2GAF and a PMP, a few other certifications, uh, but enough about me. Um, the, the last session we talked about was uh, all about the basics of, uh, of a cloud and specifically um, uh, AWS cloud. So we start off with what is the cloud, how does the cloud benefit us? Uh, I, I drew a parallelism and an analogy between a cloud and uh, in a Walmart, right? So if you go to Walmart, you go and, and start putting stuff in your uh, bucket. And at the time of the checkout at the POS, the point of sales, you basically uh, take out stuff and then you uh, pay. Similarly, you can draw that parallelism with any, any cloud, in fact. Uh, you can you know pick and choose what services you want, you use them, you pay them at, and at the end of the month and you can uh, turn them off. And of course, there are a lot of tools that comes with it. Uh, for example, you have the uh, um, uh, auto scaling group ASG. You have CloudWatch. Uh, you know, so those are the things you can you can take advantage uh, when it comes to auto scale up and then actually uh, uh, or scale down, um, depending on your needs and bring the cost um, down or up, uh, depending uh, again on the traffic that is coming to your website. So we covered uh, that aspect uh, in the first session. In today's session, in the next uh, 50 55 minutes, uh, what I'll try to do is uh, at a high level take you guys uh, to two different services which are very very essential uh within aws right one is the accessibility and the other one is the storage right so uh we'll, we'll i'll try to uh go through the accessibility first uh what are the you know accessibility services within aws the roles permissions and features and policies and whatnot um i'll also jump over to aws console so you can kind of uh, have a sneak preview of uh if you guys already uh not logged into the AWS account, uh, then you can see how it looks like. And obviously I would highly encourage you to set up an account on AWS. It won't cost you much. Um, and once you set it up, then you can start playing with the, uh, with the roles permissions uh, uh, within AWS. And, and then the latter half, uh, ha latter half of the class today, we will actually go through the uh, uh, storage uh, within AWS and we'll cover uh, as many uh, sub services uh, within uh, storage, for example, S3 buckets, the glacier, the snowball, um, EFS, elastic file systems, as many as we can in the next uh, last 30 minutes of this session. With that, uh, let's go ahead and jump right into accessibility. So accessibility, I am allows user to control who has access to which services and at what level, right? So because, you know, if you log into Amazon, as a root account, then you will see a lot of services available at your disposal, right? And you can just go and start those services. For example, you have EC2 instances that you can start and stop. And again, with an EC2, you have different variety of EC2 instances. We'll cover that in our maybe third session, I think, which will be two weeks from now, um, how to actually start and stop EC2 instances within Windows, within the Linux environment. And again, you have multiple uh, flavors of Linux, Ubuntu, and, uh, and others that you can Red Hat, right? Um, that you can uh, turn on and off, but how do you actually give access to the others, right? So uh, that is all about the accessibility and IAM role, roles and, and feature set and policies within uh, within AWS. IAM users traditionally uh, uh, traditional concepts of the user groups and access control policies. So this is a very a traditional concept. If you're coming from no matter which background, you should probably be aware of what a users groups and access uh, control policies are. And it's the same concept that has been carried forward into AWS as well. Uh, IAM can be very granular to limit a single user to the ability to perform single action on a specific resource from a specific IP address during a specific time window. It's, uh, it's, a, it's a mouthful, but if you look at it, I've highlighted the important items in red, right? It is very granular, right? So you can actually say, uh, this, this user uh, has only, uh, you know, uh, read write access only right or maybe this user can upload to this bucket and then again we can probably uh do some of these examples in the subsequent sessions um and also you can specify which user has access to it right so you can specify the user um you can uh, specify the single action using the access control list right acl right you can also specify the ip address right using the security groups right so you can say 
uh, if an IP address, you know, uh, 241.2.2.2, for example, it's uh, coming and hitting your web server, then block it because, uh, you know, or maybe allow this user to access it, right? So you can control these kind of uh, uh, accessibility to your EC2 instances by using either a uh, security groups and or maybe ACL control list. Um, and again, uh, we'll touch ACL, the AC access control list and security groups in later session when we come into the networking, maybe fourth session. Uh, but just keep that in mind that you can, you have full control over it. Okay, so uh, a typical scenario is basically, you know, a user who's uh, is sitting on on, uh, on on an external site, they want to access it. Obviously, they they have to be given an, a role, right? Um, within AWS, that user can be assigned a role, let's say admin role, and they can also have a, 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 the a security key actually. But again, we'll cover that in later. But for now, you can think of the admin role is assigned to that user, and then within the role, you can assign those permissions. Um, and once that user has a role and permissions on a specific service, that user can only log in and then and then actually manipulate those services that he's assigned to. Other than that, he cannot do anything. If you give a full admin role, then obviously the whole world is for that user to be used. And that user can actually go into different services within AWS, um, turn on or off, or maybe increase this, uh, the uh, size of a EC2 instance, add more memory to it. So that user as an admin role can do all that kind of stuff. Um, and again, when, when I'll walk you through in the actual AWS console, you will, through, you will see how you can actually create a role and how do you assign those uh, permissions or feature sets within that role. Uh, remember, the IAM is not an identity store authorization system for your application, right? So uh, if, if you have an application that is hosted on Amazon, then you have to make sure that authentication of that application is within your own boundaries, right? Um, the only IAM, uh, what IAM does is basically allows user to access that EC2, which is hosting your application, right? But it does not really become a system or a record where you can go and then uh, verify or validate or authenticate a user who's trying to access your application, right? So let's say if your application is, you know, uh, abc.com, which is hosted on an EC2 instance, and a person who's trying to access your abc.com tries to log in, and you say, I want to access, you know, I want to access, allow this user uh, based on the accessibility on the IAM role, you cannot do that, right? You have to have your own internal applications and, and maybe Active Directory and whatnot, the federated Active Directory that needs to authenticate that user who's coming and accessing your application. However, a person who wants to access and manipulate your EC2 instance that is hosting abc.com, that is part of the IAM role, okay? So again, it's not an identity store authorization system for your application. Permission that you assign are permissions to manipulate AWS infrastructure, not permission within your application. It's just reinforcing the point number one that I mentioned. And it's not an operating system identity management, okay? So these are the key three things that I would probably say you guys can take away from, uh, you know, what I am is not, okay? Let me go to the next slide. Uh, the key concepts in IAM are groups, users, roles, and policies, which are basically uh, permissions. Pretty self-explanatory. You can create a group, and then you can assign different users in that group, and you can assign a role uh, to uh, to that group as well. And then there are policies, which are permissions. So, for example, you create a group of uh, HR, right? So you say, okay, all of the HR employees would fall under this this HR group, and then you say John Doe um, and you know Fasol Khwaja would actually go under that HR. HR group. So you take those uh, users and actually uh, put them under that HR. So this way you're not really creating. You can also assign those policies as part of those groups. So you say anybody who's part of that group would actually adhere to these policies. Now policies could be um, this person can only view if I'm in HR, for example, or uh, I can only see the list of all the employees within uh, as part of the infrastructure. Or if I'm in finance, I want to only see the reports of all the EC2 instance uh, that are being consumed because I have to pay the bills at the end of the month for AWS. So I will allow you only um, a limited view, limited access to the uh, uh, to to AWS, and that might be only the finance piece, which is the uh, which is the billing portion of it. So the unit assign that policy put the users in those groups, you define those users and put them in the group and then you define those policies and part, attach those to part of the part of the groups. And this way, whenever you have those uh, new uh, 
uh, people coming in, you just drop them into the groups and then basically they automatically inherit those. And again, um, we will cover one example, how to create those groups and, um, and roles and permissions. Uh, again, a, a, a good visuals, visual over here is a customer managed policies. So for example, you have a group admin, right? And there are two users, Alice and Suzanne, for example, and policy account admin, right? So it's a multi, MFA means a multi uh, authentication, right? Factor authentication. So, but this, uh, these two users who are part of the admins group, they have everything that's why you see checks over here right so they are the policies uh, uh, which are basically associated to this group admin says this these two person or whoever is dropping this group they can do anything and everything right so that's why you see all of those checks so again you define those in the policies and then you put those policies or associate those policies part part of the group and then you create the users and then associate those uh, users uh, to that group so hopefully that is very clear in terms of how, how these uh, policies, users and groups are, are interconnected together, right? So now if there is a, a, a limited group admin, for example, Dave and Sarah, right? So they have limited access or different policies, right? What you do is basically you define what is, this person has a role, which is an EC2 access and a role to the application, right? So it could be a book apps and they have certain different policies, right? So um, what you do is basically you can associate those policies to this role and you give that role to, uh, to, a, uh, to your application, for example. Now, a good example would be, uh, let's say if you had have an uh, application which is running on your EC2 in instance, right? And that EC2 instance need to access, let's say, your QuickSight uh, data warehouse, uh, the uh, or Redshift, or maybe a QuickSight uh, uh, BI tool. So what you can do is you can that that BI tool can assume a role which basically says that okay, these are the policies that are associated with this role, and whenever this machine needs to access that quick site, the BI tool or Redshift, the data warehouse, you can allow this user from EC2 to connect to it, right? So this is how you actually give a, assume a role in order to connect the different other policies. So role comes very handy when you're talking infrastructure within AWS and talking to other infrastructure within AWS. Uh, it could be a Lambda service, right? So if a Lambda service, which is a serverless architecture, which needs to talk to, let's say, a database, that Lambda service can assume a role in order to connect to the database. And you can define those policies and associate those policies with that role so that that role can connect to that database, which is basically hosting all of your information, for example. So again, a role can be assumed by a infrastructure service within AWS and policies can be associated with that. And then you can assume that role and access any uh, service within AWS. So these are two different scenarios where basically one is, uh, is a, a group and then you attach the policies and then associate users in that group. And anybody who's part of that group would actually have the same policies. Then you can have limited groups, uh, which basically have limited policies associated with that group. Anybody who's part of that limited group would actually have very limited policies associated with them. Then, of course, uh, the third scenario is the assume uh, role, which could be an a service within AWS, which basically needs to connect to other services on AWS. So you can assume that role while connecting to the other services. Okay, so I hope that is uh, clear, at least um, until you try it out yourself, that it would be very clear, especially um, going back to this one with the assume, assume role, you may want to probably spend a little bit more time this is, becomes very handy when you're trying to um, when you're trying to actually SSH, for example. Uh, if you're not familiar with SSH, then I'm talking about the uh, the uh, shell terminal within a Linux that you're trying to connect uh, from a, a terminal into your EC2 instance, and then from that EC2 instance, you are trying to connect to your database. So then that EC2 instance that you are SSH intoing, uh, basically, or if you're using a PuTTY uh, as in Windows, then you need to assume that the, once you connect to that EC2 instance, you need to assume a role in order to connect some other services. So that might become uh, sometimes very handy and a little bit uh, interesting concept that you need to understand uh, by going a little bit into more details and, and maybe getting your hands dirty and trying to assume a role with an EC2 instance, either Windows or a Linux machine and try to connect to something else, okay? 
Okay, so um, the the way basically uh, the the whole um, uh, accessibility is is uh, it, it comes into work is basically you could have a, a principal a request. So this is a use case scenario, for example, right? So this is the account ID, which may, basically is the complete AWS account for this user, right? Um, so if a request comes in, then obviously you have to authenticate, and there are roles, users, uh, and application that are sitting uh, as part of your AWS environment, right? So the first tier is basically the authorization. Whenever the user comes in, they need to go through the authorization, right? So the authorization may be the policies, right? In my previous example, for example, I said um, you may have certain policies enabled, certain policies disabled for you. Uh, as you can see in this diagram as well, maybe a few policies are um, enabled and maybe one policy not enabled, right? So that is uh, disabled. So when, when basically uh, you come in, you have an identity-based policies and, Everything is written in a JSON based editor, right? So for example, what are the resources you can have, right? What are the actions you can perform, right? Uh, if you come uh, with that identity within the AWS, uh, then you once you authorize, once you authorize, get authorization from here, then you can go into different actions, right? So basically you, you can do some services, create a bucket, delete a bucket or list a bucket on S3. Um, you can start, rerun the instance, start or stop the instances. So this is the next step. But before you do that, you have to make sure you come through the authorization clean before you come into the actions. And again, these are the policies that gets, for, uh, gets forwarded to the action saying, okay, do you really have the permission to create a bucket? Do you really have the permission to delete? Uh, do you really have permission to list a bucket? And so on and so forth, right? And obviously there are just a few examples over here. There are many, many services within AWS. Every, every service that is within AWS can further be uh, granular in terms of what permissions you have. Uh, is it read only, write only, update only, delete only? You know, those permission can be set at those services level. Um, and then once uh, you have have those, then you can probably access those services. For example, uh, once this is uh, cleared, then okay, while well, you have these uh, permission, then you can have access to the resources. So, so you can see the three tiers, the authorization tier, the action tier that you want to perform by loading up those policies from the previous one, and then actually accessing the resources at the last tier. But they all kind of come together um, when you actually uh, pr uh, create users, groups, roles, and permission, they all come to life and they start uh, performing uh, their duties when they are actually, you are trying to access a certain um, service or resource uh, within AWS. Um, let's go on to the next slide. Um, so a, a principal is an IAM entity that is allowed to interact with AWS resources, falling at the three types of principles, a root user, a users, or the roles temp security tokens, right? A root user is the, uh, is the user that is created for the very first time, right? When, I don't know if you guys have already created an account or not. If you, if you haven't, you should definitely create an account on AWS. Um, you can put in the credit card and then again, you will be charged only the things that you will use or the time that you will consume, right? If there are free tier available on AWS as well, uh, for example, if you want to launch an EC2 instance uh, and you want to just play with that, uh, you can go ahead and launch an EC2 free tier instance, right? And so you will not be charged. Uh, but as a, as a safe practice, make sure you turn it off uh, by the time you're done. Uh, go ahead and create S3 buckets, maybe delete it after you're done. So those are the things you may want to still play with that. But that is the first user when you create it, uh, becomes a root user, right? Uh, you don't really want to use and log in with your root user uh, most of the time. What you can do is you can uh, downgrade your own user into maybe just a user and give the right permissions and maybe allow multi-factor authentication, MFA, at the root user level. Here's the reason. So in case if your system get, gets hacked and your root user is basically exposed, then anyone who has access and it's not MFA, multi-factor authentication, then anybody can come in and actually um, get in, log into your system and you know, uh, basically create, delete and whatnot to your infrastructure. But if you have an MFA and there is a they may biometric or whatever you want to have it or separate email or phone calls. Now there are a lot of ways you can do MFAs. So if you have that MFA, then the user cannot actually uh, access unless they, they have that MFA uh, authentications. So 
having the root user always uh, secondary MFA authentication is always a good practice. So that's why I was saying, go ahead and create a root user, set up on your account, then, then you can start using your user. With the root user, you save your user ID, password, and also MFA, and never you don't have to use that again, unless if you really find a need. Uh, you can always elevate your user level account to different uh, permissions uh, by logging into the root user, and so that this way you can upgrade or downgrade. But again, your root user always have the multi-factor authentication enabled, so this way, again, you are safe. You, got, you can also have uh, roles of temp security uh, tokens. And again, these are the things that you are, uh, I was talking about earlier where you are saying um, um, Amazon EC2 rules, granting permission to application running on AWS EC2. So this is where you actually, um, uh, you are actually assuming a role as an EC2 instance or maybe Lambda service who's talking to a database. Um, and, and this is all done through the SDS, the security token services, right? And, and these are time bound. So if you get a assumed role, this may probably work for a certain period of time after that is going to expire. Uh, cross account access, you can also uh, go from your one account, AWS, and also use the STS token to access the other. Or federation granting permission to user authentication by a trusted external system. So this is, can, this is where your ADS, the active directory services, the federated active directory services may come in. So if you have uh, ADS installed, or maybe some other um, uh, secure the authentication mechanism, uh, uh, which is basically entrusted by you. You can also always uh, uh, authenticate using that system as well. But there is a little longer process that you have to uh, follow. But these are the temporary roles and permissions uh, you can allow to uh, to a machine or to an uh, application that can access your uh, AWS services. Okay, so again, principle is broken into three pieces, role, root users, users, and then temporary roles. Okay, um, uh, Amazon authentication, three ways that I am authenticated, username, password, obviously this is very simple, access keys used during API calls from within SDK. So the second way, if you are trying to um, uh, access your application, um, let's say outside, then you need to provide an API, you need to provide a access key, which uh, Amazon uh, always uh, distributes whenever you're starting up, let's say your EC2 instance. So it gives you an uh, a, a RSA key, 256 AES, and then you can actually embed that in your API calls, and then the, the normal handshaking happens, and then basically you can access the services. The other one is a access a key session token operated under assumed role. Again, this is the one that I talked about uh, earlier. Okay. Okay, um, groups, uh, IAM group is a collection of IAM users. Uh, a use, typical use case would be uh, you could have a group called admins and have that group the types of permission that administrators typically need. Any user in that group automatically has the permission that are assigned to that group. Again, uh, the definition of group is pretty common across uh, different environments. Um, so let's say in Windows NT or Windows Server, you may probably use a, a group uh, entities, the same concept brought over here. Okay, um, so... So now here you can create different groups, right? For example, you have uh, admin groups, two groups, uh, users only, uh, developers, maybe multiple, which has a limited uh, access, and maybe test users may have different. So again, you may want to probably bifurcate based on the needs. Uh, roles, an IAM role is an IAM identity that you can create in your account that has uh, specific permissions, right? We talked about that in a previous slide. Uh, IAM role is similar to an IAM user in that there's a user, I, I am uh, I, AWS, identity with permission policies that determine what the identity can and cannot do, okay? Uh, I'm gonna, next one, policy. Let's go to the policy and permission. You manage access in AWS by creating policies and attaching them to an IAM identity users, groups, or users or roles, right? So that is a key point, right? Uh, you can create uh, policies and you can attach in any one of them, users, groups, or users or roles, right? A policy is an object in AWS that when associated with an identity or resource defines their permissions. When we covered that last slide or a few slides back, I showed you that you have the authentication, then you have to find out what policies does this user has, right? So does this user have a create bucket or a copy bucket or delete bucket permissions or not? So these are the policies that um, AWS actually determined on the, on the fly when a, a user is actually coming and logging into the system. Um, policies are mostly stored in the JSON format. If you're not familiar, uh, JSON is basically just a, you know, Java ob object notation, which is in a, a key value pair. So you have the key and then you have the value. For example, this is the version, this is the value, effect, allow, action, services, a prefix, 
uh, and these are the condition, right? So these are basically uh, uh, JSON objects, which are basically part of your policies. You don't have to code these. I just gave you an example here that, uh, you know, these policies are actually um, written by AWS environment and in a JSON because it becomes very uh, human readable. And also you can modify them. Um, also, if you're using a, a um, AWS uh, CLI or using an AWS SDK, you can easily manipulate those policies using the SDK as well. So that's why they have actually chose to use uh, JSON. Um, other key factor, factors of features of uh, accessibility, multi-factor, MFA, rotating keys, and resol revol resolving multiple permissions. Uh, rotating keys is a key concept, um, which is basically, AWS provides you the KMS, the key management system. So uh, you wanna make sure that you use KMS, key management system, to, to take a key, uh, flush the key, renew the key, uh, put an expiration key. Um, if you are interested in, in how the whole operation works, look into the KMS the key management system with AWS, right? Um, if you're an architect or intending to be an architect, um, then you may want to probably define a policy uh, so that your infrastructure is always secure to use the KMS and have the rotating key. So in case if something bad happens and the keys get released for whatever reason, um, you know, you're not using the same key. It's a very small time window when those keys are exposed and after that the, the, you have a new keys. MFA, I've already talked about it where you want to use for the root users. All right, uh, you know what? Let's uh, jump over to AWS environment on accessibility and let me just walk you through a little bit. So give me one second here, please. Bring this tab over here. Let me log in. All right, so when you log in, obviously, uh, you know, if you have a root user, which I have right now, right, as an admin role, I would actually go in and I can see all those services. Um, if you actually scroll just a little bit up, uh, security and identity compliance on the top, right? So these are the uh, all the you know, sub-services which comes under security, identity, and compliance, right? So if I go in under IAM, this is where you actually have all the users that can be created, the groups, the users, the roles, the policies, identity providers. This is where if you want to have your external identities uh, authentication, right? Um, you can also bring that, that, that in. Uh, so that is all actually set up over here. The important items that you may want to probably focus on in this session, I'm just keeping a tap on the time as well, is the groups, users, and roles and policies, right? So let's click on the, and by the way, on this dashboard, <coughs> excuse me, you can see how many users there are in the system, 29, uh, sorry, 29 users, uh, 26 groups, uh, customer managed uh, policies. Uh, we have defined some, uh, um, some customized policies. There are 32, uh, there are 42 roles defined. Uh, we haven't really used any external uh, identity providers, so that's why you see zero, right? Okay, so if I go under groups, uh, these are different groups. For example, I was talking about the finance, right? So um, here you see that is a finance group, right? So I have one resource who's defined over here. I can go ahead and remove uh, what are the permissions. So this person has the billing, right? If you want to see the policies, here's the policy, right? So payment methods. So this guy can see um, all of those that are related to the payment methods, right? Um, a, we can ignore the access advisors advanced topic. But uh, again, if you want to add more users, you can go click on the add users to group and then you can define, for example, I can find myself, I can spell my name. Oh, sorry, okay, let me just, uh... there we go. So if you want to add somebody, you can go ahead and select this user add user and this user will actually come to that uh, user group. Now remember, once you add that user, all of the policies that are part of that uh, group, they will be all part of this uh, user who you just recently added. And um, I've already shown you what are the permissions. This is a billing permission, right? Uh, if you want to add a, um, let me just say, go ahead. If you want to create a new group, you can go click on create new group. For example, I can say test group, right? And then the next step is attach the policies, right? So I'm creating a user group, right? And I'm saying, what are the policies that needs to be attached to this group? So I can say Amazon S3 full access. Um, I can say Amazon EC2 full access. So if I give these two um, uh, policies to this group, let's go back and search for test. Here it is. 
So if I click back on this, so these are the two policies, right? So if you go and then look at this uh, policies, obviously this policies has EC2 allow everything, all of the resources with an EC2, right? Um, let's close this. Amazon S3 full access show policies. So this user, again, this group, sorry, has allow S3 everything. So you can create, delete, update, whatever you may have, you can do everything, right? So um, this way you can, uh, you can go ahead and create a group and associate the policies. Now I'm going and, and at, attaching, um, attaching a, a, group, a user in this user, in this group, right? For example, uh, let me see, uh, maybe not even here. Okay, so let's say go ahead. So for example, I say, okay, this guy, add users, right? So this user is added to this group. Now this user has all these two policies, can do anything and everything. And, um, and, and actually, uh, you know, you can remove that uh, user from this group or you can delete the group entirely or you can add or remove the policies as well, okay? Um, one thing I'd like to share. Okay, let me see users. Yes, okay. Um, okay, so um, this is actually when you want to actually look into the accounts, uh, account, uh, your, your own main account, you can go in there. I was actually looking at for something else, but that's all right. Okay, so these are all the roles that we have created, right? So for example, if I click on any one of them role, right? So again, remember, so the roles can be assumed by an, by an EC2 instance, for example, and that EC2 instance can talk to a database. So you want to give a specific permission to that role that needs to be attached to the EC2 instance or, or and then also that EC2 instance needs to talk to the database. So for example, I picked up this, um, this AWS uh, Codec 2 and this has a two policies as attached to it, right? It has Amazon EC2 role for AWS code deploy and AWS code deploy role. Uh, these two policies, uh, we have a CICD, continuous integration, continuous deployment, right? So uh, in order for us to, to deploy the code in, let's say in, uh, on an EC2 instance, which is hosting our CICD, I want to assume a role so that I can start deploying it on an EC2 instance, right? So that application needs to assume that role. So this user, AWS uh, a code uh, EC2, basically has an access to an EC2 instance code deploy and code deploy role, okay? So this way, whenever we are actually deploying a code on the code deploy, which is Amazon service, which you can use to actually do CI CD, this user can do that because it has permission, okay? Um, if you want to give more roles, more permission, you can easily go ahead and associate this other permissions with the same role and the user can actually get associated with that role. Uh, again, that is the assumption, uh, assuming that role uh, for that user so that they can perform well on, on some other permissions that you may want to associate. Um, let's go to the policies. These are all the predefined policies within uh, Amazon. Uh, and there are a few that we have defined as well. Uh, you can go ahead and, and look at uh, any one of them uh, and see what are the policies. For example, this particular uh, policy <clears throat> allows eight of 235 services. It's basically EC2, IAM. It can list, read, read, list, read. You know, these are all the um, policy that are associated with this um, uh, with this per these permission associated with this policy, right? If you want to create your own policy, which is which is may maybe less uh, relaxed, you can go ahead and create uh, click on create policy, and then you can start you know creating uh, your own policy. For example, I can choose from services. I may say uh, I want to create a policy around EFS, for example, right? What do you want to do? I want to have list rights, read tagging, right? So you can select all those. Right, and then you can you can see these are all the create file system, tagging file system. You can review the policy. Okay, and you show remaining 234. These are all the policy that are associated with this um, previous one. For the EFS action list, describe access point, file system, read tagging. 
So once you are done with these uh, policies, uh, any, for example, review policy, here it is. So now EFS, full list read and tagging. So this EFS is an elastic file system. So you are now saying, um, I, I am creating a new policy which would allow this policy to access the EFS with read, write, and tagging. Again, I haven't really changed anything, but if you want to have only read or maybe write or customize it, you can easily do it by creating your own policy. Once you create that policy, again, just like we did in the user roles and groups, you can associate with that policy uh, as a customized policy associated with that group or maybe at the role, if you want to assume that role, and then you can as uh, associate users to it, okay? I hope uh, I'm making myself clear but again, if you, if you don't want to use any of the existing AWS policies, you want to create your own policy, you have the flexibility of doing that. Okay, I'm gonna cancel out of that. So this kind of a covers uh, groups, user role. AWS instant storage, right? Um, there are different types of storages, right? So AWS provides you what's called ephemeral storage. Uh, it provides you EBS storage, right? Uh, it provides you the S3 type of storage, a Glacier storage, right? Uh, snowball storage, right? EFS storage. So these are different services that Amazon uh, provides uh, to you. Uh, and and, and you, you be the judge of which service makes sense in what scenario, right? So we'll start off with the AWS instance uh, storage. What is instance storage? The instance storage is also referred as ephemeral storage. And what this means is it's a temporary uh, level of storage that is associated with your drive, okay? Or your machine, uh, sorry, with your machine, right? Um, now, if you are using a uh, Windows machine, for example, you can think of this as a, your C storage, right? So whenever you have a C drive, you have a storage associated with that where you have your operating system and maybe some of your data files and whatnot. That is the storage, which is basically called the ephemeral storage within AWS, right? Uh, why? Because whenever you turn off the machine or the virtual machine, um, or maybe remove that machine or you stop that machine, uh, uh, then, then the storage is gone, right? Your, your data is gone, right? Obviously, if you're using your C drive and you turn off your laptop, it's gonna come back, in, uh, come back up and then you, there you have it uh, because you're not throwing away your laptop. But if you're if you terminating your virtual machine, then that storage is gone. You, all of your data on that uh, ephemeral storage slash C drive is gone. Um, so you have to be very careful what you store on your ephemeral storage, which is associated with your, uh, with your EC2 instance. Now, uh, if you are uh, rebooting your machine, right, your ephemeral storage will not go away. If you are pausing or stopping your uh, EC2 instance, it will not go away. But if you, are, uh, if you are actually terminating it, then your ephemeral storage or slash C drive storage will go away, okay? Uh, in Linux, of course, it has an EBS, which is, which is a partition equivalent of C drive. Same, same phenomena, right? So if you have a, a, a EBS, elastic uh, block storage, uh, as, a, as a default that is a, attached to your EC2 instance, which is your ephemeral storage, if you restart your uh, virtual machine as a Linux machine, it will not go away. If you uh, stop it, right, it will not go away. But if you terminate it, then it, that storage is going to go away and all of your data is going to go on, right? So be careful with that, okay? Uh, let's go to the next slide. Uh, then comes the AWS EBS, Elastic Block Storage, right? This is a, a very, very powerful thing, right? I, I, I love using EBS a lot, why? Because, you know, um, it gives you a lot of flexibility in order to um, elastically increase or decrease, right? Um, uh, whenever you need it, right? Uh, you can think of uh, these EBS, they're called EBS or elastic uh, block storage as a virtual drives, which are elastic in nature. Again, they're rubber bands, right? So you can go, uh, go up or go down depending on your usage, but you pay on the allocation, not on the uh, usage, right? It comes with the chunk of 64, uh, uh, right? So, it's, uh, so whenever you're using it, uh, you, you have to make sure it comes with the 64 blocks, right? Uh, they will charge you for that 64 block size, right? Um, you can, you can uh, use only 20% uh, of it or 100% of it, but again, you have to pay the whole, for the whole storage, store, 64 block. Uh, it can be connected to the EC2 instance only, and uh, which means uh, in the previous slide, I was talking about the instance storage. So let's say you have the C drive, right? Uh, just quote and quote, C drive uh, in feral, right? Uh, and then you want to add some more external storage. We don't go away when you actually terminate your e uh, virtual machine. 
you will need an EBS, right? That is where you would store all of your important files, right? Um, you don't really need to store your, your operating system there, right? Operating system would be part of your ephemeral storage and if it goes away, it goes away, it doesn't matter. But if you have your important data files then you need to store it on the EBS. Now EBS becomes an uh, extra external drive that can be associated or attached to the EC2 instance, just a plugin, right? And very easy to associate uh, to your EC2 instance. Once you attach to it, then you have uh, then you have basically extra drive space on your uh, EC2 instance. Okay, uh, these are general pricing. Again, I'm not. I don't want to uh, go into the details of pricing. You can look at it. Uh, they're dirt cheap. Uh, then it comes the Amazon S3 uh, storage. Uh, Amazon S3 storage is very cheap. Uh, again, not cheaper than the Glacier, but we'll talk about the Glacier in a second. Glacier is uh, for archiving, and that's probably the dirt cheap storage uh, that you can have on AWS. S3 is uh, again in a block level storage. It's available globally, right? So you think of that as a bucket where the bucket is available uh, globally uh, with a unique name. Uh, granular level permission, you can set the uh, permission uh, at, let's say, at the object level of the bucket. Um, sorry, one second. Uh, they are automatically replicated across the availability zone. So you don't have to worry about uh, my data getting lost if I store something. Buckets are folder. You can think of them as the folders uh, and uh, which contain objects and object would be the files. Uh, but, but bucket names are global, meaning if you create an account on AWS, you create a bucket called my bucket, then there's only one my bucket under your name, right? So under your account, you cannot have the my bucket across different regions or different availability zone. Dur durability is uh, 99.99. So basically you don't have to worry about that data getting lost because again, it is replicated across. Uh, in order to access an object from your HTML, uh, for example, from your browser, uh, this is a uh, very simple uh, URL that you can use in our order to access that uh, object on that uh, location on that bucket. But again, you need to have the permission. If you don't have the permission, obviously you won't be able to uh, have access to that. Um, life cycle, uh, there is a life cycle specified within S3. And again, hopefully I will have time today. So I can show you the life cycle of an S3 bucket where you can uh, define what happens once the object is uh, is stale, is maybe six months or eight months or a year old, then what do you do? You can define those uh, life cycles within the S3 bucket. Uh, there's a, next topic is the AWS Elastic File System store, Storage, uh, EFS, right? So it was implemented uh, off uh, NFS, Network File System, uh, by Sun in 1984. It is a Elastic File Storage capacity, pay, without, pay what you use and grow dynamically. So this is uh, different from EBS. Remember in the EBS, I said you get a block of 64, uh, but here you can actually, uh, you, can, you can say, okay, I want an EFS, and you can just copy one file on that EFS, right? Just think of this as your um, Explorer in Windows or maybe file manager uh, within your uh, Linux environment. And and once you drop a file over there, that's what you're gonna get charged, right? And again, there's a computational uh, uh, engine which basically look at the size of the file, the storage, the duration of that file that's been kept there. And then it, it builds you at the end of the month. It is multi-AZ store and can be mounted from on-premise. So basically, um, this is an extension. So if you want to mount a file, this is where EFS comes in. You create an EFS and then you mount the EFS uh, to uh, to your EC2 instance, for example, right? And now all of a sudden you have a large storage just like EBS, but again, EBS would come with 64 blocks, EFS, you pay as you grow. But the caveat is it's 20% more costly, right? So that's the, uh, that's the only downside on the EFS. Um, there are advantages in using EFS. So obviously uh, if you're doing a hot deployments, then you have a sh network share drive, which basically can do deployments in multiple uh, location, for example, in this case, I'm showing you e AWS Elastic File System Storage. Uh, it, you have two web application. Uh, so, for example, a developer sitting here doing some code changes, and you have EFS installed on a AWS environment. The data is getting synced by between the the developer's code that is being pushed out and the EFS mount. And then from EFS, you have a two mounts on two different uh, AZs of availability zone. We talked about the availability zone in the last session. Hopefully you remember that. And uh, you can get that uh, file that has been pushed by the developer from that common EFS 
into that mount point and then finally pushed into the web in the front. So these are two separate AZ. So if this goes down, you still have this or vice versa. But again, notice you are just doing deployment in one uh, EFS, one file server, and then they get automatically pointed to the other location. If you have, now this is a very simple scenario, but if you have, you know, big companies like Dell and IBM and, you know, huge Apple, and you want to make sure none of your servers go down, so obviously you would have farms of servers, right? So, this strategy works great because now you don't have to deploy on like 200 servers. You just do it on those EFS. Maybe you have five or 10 EFSs and those five EFS are serving 20 uh, packs of 20 and makes it 100 servers, okay? So again, it is costly, but it gives you a huge ad advantage. Again, I think I mentioned that at the start where I said, you know, uh, it's just like Walmart, right? So you need to find out what you need, right? And you say, okay, I want this. And does this uh, suffice what I need? Is the price right? Then you put it in the bucket. Same thing on, on the cloud. And again, same thing on AWS cloud, right? Specifically. Um, you find out if EFS is the right fit for you, then you use that for deployments. Uh, if S3 is the right fit for your content storage, objects, files, and you want to give a specific permission for the outside world as well, use the S3 buckets. Um, if you want to actually attach something to your uh, EC2 instance, then you use the uh, EPS. Um, lastly, file systems. Uh, let's uh, skip this because I think uh, uh, quickly cover the cold storage uh, options, which are the Glacier. Uh, what Glacier is basically, um, you, you can think of as a as a very deep, you know, um, under the <laughs> um, ocean. You can throw your file and forget about it, right? So uh, the the reason for this is basically if you have the large files data sets that are not needed because of compliance reason for, but you have to keep it for the compliance reason for five years and seven years. For example, uh, the credit card transactions or maybe your tax uh, returns for a company who's filing taxes for corporates and whatnot. Uh, they have to maintain those uh, regulations, right? In order to maintain those regulations, um, you have to store it somewhere. Now, if you store it on S3 or EFS, it's gonna be costly or EBS. Uh, Amazon, uh, what Amazon does is basically provides you a very um, cheap, uh, dirt cheap uh, storage solution, and that is uh, that is the Glacier. So what you do is basically you, you you take the files, you move them over to Glacier, and then you put a lock to it. It's called vault lock. And then once you vault lock within 24 hours, then that data is gone. If you want to retrieve it, obviously you can retrieve it, but the retrieval time would be maybe 24 hours, right? Uh, so they have some certain SLA. So again, you have to be very careful what you store in the glaciers uh, because you may not retrieve it immediately. So um, it's a very slow retrieval process. Cheapest solution for long-term storage, about $1 per terabyte, right, per month, right? So it's very cheap. Retrieval time standards, 12 hours, uh, bulk in 48 hours. Recently, I was just reading on the one of the uh, white paper on AWS and it seems like um, uh, you can actually pay more and, uh, and, and and get it faster retrieval, right? So it's just like Spirit, uh, Spirit Airline, right? So if you want to have, you know, have one bag, you pay this, you have two bags, you pay this. If you want front, more legs room. So um, love that, right? So you can uh, break it out and, and ba based on what you need, you pay just for that. So if you want fast retrieval, you can definitely do that. Um, Snowball, again, if you have large data set uh, that is sitting on your premise and you want to migrate over to AWS, uh, you can transfer that in using these boxes called Snowball devices, and uh, you can get them from AWS, you can uh, put them uh, on your data center and then actually pipe the data into it, and then from there you can actually uh, send it across for quick, <coughs> for quick um, uh, upload on the AWS. Otherwise, if you have like, you know, I don't know, zillions and zillions of terabytes of data, how would you transfer to AWS, right? So you want to probably think of something smart, right? And then using Snowball might be the best and effective way. Enough about theory. Uh, let's quickly take a few last minutes uh, on, on the uh, actual playing with the AWS environment. Uh, if you go to AWS main environment, here you will see the storage, right? Right here. Uh, it has S3, EFS, we talked about elastic file storage. Uh, you can ignore FSX, I don't really use that. Uh, S3 Glacier, again, we talked about uh, storage, uh, gateway, uh, and then AWS backup, right? Um, these are the key uh, elements or key subservices within the storage services, right? So if I go, for example, uh, S3, real quick. Here are my buckets, for example, right? Uh, let's go ahead and create a, a bucket real quick. Test bucket for yes. Okay, sorry. 
right? You can define which where you want to actually create the bucket. So I'm going to just leave it in Virginia. Next, you can copy the setting from the existing bucket if you if you want to. I'm not going to copy them over. Uh, the next step will take you uh, some of the uh, uh, properties, right? Configuration options. For example, keep all version of an object in the same bucket um, if you want to. Uh, server access logging. Log if you want to log every action, which you should not, right? But if you want to, you can. You can use tagging to track project costs. So um, if you want to make sure that uh, you build someone when the bucket is being used in terms of storage size accessibility, you can tag saying, okay, HR, you know, um, buckets, uh, finance buckets, blah, 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 engineering bucket. And then you can, at the end of the month, find out who's using the most. Uh, record object level API activity using it as trail, cloud trail. So if you want to, again, auditing purposes, if you want to use uh, logging, then you can allow that. Uh, encryption, if you want to keep the objects in encrypted format, definitely. You can play with all of these. I'm not gonna go through all of uh, these. Uh, block all public access. Uh, so I'm not gonna say that. Disabling, it gives you permission, I acknowledge, and you can go click on next. Create the bucket. Right, so, so the bucket has been created. Here it is. So this is objects can be public, right? So I created this bucket, I click on this. Now here I can go ahead and upload the files, right? So if I go click upload, add a file. So for example, this might be a screenshot. Next. Okay. And read write permissions, manage public. So this is public. Okay, now within these storage buckets, you do have uh, uh, other uh, tiers of pricing, right? Standard, intelligent tiering, standard IA. Uh, do read up on that or Glacier where you want to archive it, encryption. All of these properties are um, self-explanatory. You can find it from their uh, site, but let's click on that, upload. You can see progress bar here. There we go, so that bucket is actually um, uploaded, uh, that object is uploaded in this bucket, right? So I can click on it and when, as soon as you click on it, you can download, copy path, select from, you see all the properties uh, of that bucket, right? You can create an actions, right? For example, uh, make this public, rename, delete, copy, uh, get total size. Uh, what I want to do quickly is, here it is, what I want to show you guys uh, quickly. I think I just got a few more minutes left. Uh, management. So this is the life cycle of the bucket, of the uh, bucket, right? So uh, what happens if the bucket is like a few months old or, or whatnot, right? So you can create a life cycle. You say limit the scope to the specific prefix or text as saying um, uh, my files or whatever, anything that is my, or you can say apply to all objects. So let's uh, for the simplicity call all objects. Um, stored class trans transition, right? There are uh, pre required uh, pre Request, per request fees when using life cycles, right? So what do you want to do with these stored classes? Meaning that you want to transition uh, this, all of these objects to where? Uh, you can say, uh, clean up expired objects and delete markers and inc uh, incomplete multi-parts. You can delete the objects from there once you have a uh, clean up incomplete multi-part upload seven days. So if you want to allow up multi-uploads to the bucket, so what happens if one part is uploaded, the other one is not uploaded, you want to clean all of those, you can specify that as well after seven days or maybe one day just delete that. Uh, here you go. This Acknowledge this. Transition, okay, there are per request, okay. Next, save. So here it is, so this is my life cycle, right? So you can apply this on the bucket saying, what do you want to do uh, once something happens, right? So if the file comes over here, if there is a multi-part, which basically I don't have used it in a while and somebody has uploaded just one single file, what do, I, what do I do? I basically want to delete it, right? So you can go ahead and define that. Um, there are other buckets, uh, there are other actions you can perform uh, within, uh, within, the, uh, within this bucket, right? Um, uh, but again, you may want to probably just go ahead and play with this and to find out exactly what other transition I have. For example, select a transition, transition to IA tier, intelligence tier, Glacier. For example, I want to move this file after creation one day or multiple days after, let's say 178 days, 
uh, transition to clear a glacier after this many days, right? So this is gonna go ahead and apply for all, yes. So this is gonna add, make the action to the glacier. 